Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at short order comics number one and number two from 1973 and 1974. This was a underground comics anthology edited by Art Spiegelman. This is almost like a warm-up for Arcade Magazine, the seminal uh underground comics anthology that started, I think, maybe a year or two after these ended. And um, it was basically Art Spiegelman trying to round up like-minded cartoonists who didn't want to just do sex and drugs, rock and roll type undergrounds. Because most undergrounds, you know, no matter how great they were, so many of them kind of were just about shocking people. You know, like, hey, we have this freedom. Let's go crazy. Let's have insane gore. Let's have insane pornographic sex to show that comics can do whatever they want. But a lot of guys weren't looking at comics as a medium of expression for like adult artistic sensibilities. They were just kind of, you know, kind of scatological, um, kind of almost an adolescent energy to them. But Art Spiegelman and also Bill Griffith, who's a part of this, is um, and definitely part of Arcade later on, they co-edited the magazine. They were just like, hey, comics can be adult modes of expression, which we learned in the 80s, you know, with the alternative comics, Love and Rockets, et al., all that stuff. So this is kind of a step in that direction. Uh, sometimes the experiments are maybe failed, you could say. They're like weird little uh, obtuse comics that are just kind of head scratchers. But at least they're trying to shake things up and just make comics that are aimed at adults. And uh, so it's really some amazing stuff as of these. And it's an amazing, uh, amazing compilations of uh, great artists. So let's start with the first issue. Now this was uh, an anthology, but it's only three artists. It's just pretty much Art Spiegelman, uh, Bill Griffith, and Joe Shankman. Uh, the cover's by Art Spiegelman. Pretty goofy joke. <laughs> um... But just, I, I love his, like, design and the logo. Spiegelman's so good at that stuff. Or at least he was. He doesn't really do anything anymore. Inside front cover by uh, Joe Shankman. Joe Shankman was in all of the, like, underground papers, like East Village Other and Gothic Gothic City, Gothic Blimp Works, whatever that was called. And uh, it looks like it was hard for him to shrink down to normal comic size because all of his comics, it's, it's, uh, they're eye strainers. Uh, sometimes the the balloons are so tiny and they're so crammed with detail, but it's kind of amazing. Very uh, S. Clay Wilson inspired, um, kind of gritty, um, always drawing things that are like kind of seedy and sordid. His comics aren't very much, they're not stories. Um, almost all of them are just kind of little vignettes, which is panels showing various weird things, people saying random stuff. I find them really interesting, though. They're kind of like a snapshot of the early 70s. This one's called Yakety Yak. And like I said, it's not really much of a story. It's just a bunch of random little things. Okay, first story is uh, Zippy the Pinhead in Real Live Dolls. And this comic is totally... Uh, lampooning like fashion models and we see uh backstage all these supermodels are just you know just he's kind of skewering them they're just they seem really vapid and not that bright and very vain as you'd imagine supermodels are to be zippy shows up i guess he's like works there he's the one who zips up their <laughs> shirts and stuff and dresses and this one kind of like is taunting Zippy, kind of freaking him out by coming on to him. But she's just fucking with him. I love how he draws, like, just how she, she looks like an alien creature. Because, you know, these supermodels have uh, emaciated themselves, starved themselves. So she just looks really weird. Kind of repulsive. Here we have Skeeter Grant by Skeeter Grant. Uh, around this time, Art Spiegelman was using Skeeter Grant as his nom de plume. 
And this is a real dream that uh, the artist had where he was dreaming that he was inside a comic book and that he could actually feel like walking from panel to panel. Every time he goes from a panel to the next, he disappears for an instant when he's in the gutter. And he's got one of these uh, tin cans on his head, just like Happy Hooligan, the old comic strip character. And he's trying to get it off by every method. He starts to shoot it off with a gun. And he can't do it, so he's really sad. And this crazy guy comes by and says, what's happening? And the guy tells him, relax, buddy. It's just the style you're drawn in. So uh, the artist has a little comment that it's the only time he ever had a dream with a punchline. Which I guess that rarely happens, does it, huh? We have another another Joe Shankman piece, All Aboard for the Night Train. And once again, just, it's a travelogue. Just little vignettes of all these different cities. Usually, he makes every city just look like it's, it's the wrong side of the tracks. He's not going to draw the nice part of the city. He always uh, draws the, the seedy parts. Bill Griffith doing The Baby Einstein is nothing sacred. And Baby Einstein is a professor, you know, teaching his class. And he keeps this one woman after class. And then he starts, just so he can suckle at her teat, taking advantage of his position as a professor. We have three little gags here. And then here's a little bottom strip, Young Twist, which is a... You know, Bill Griffith was a co-editor of Young Lust. So that's a little homage to that. Art Spiegelman with Just a Piece of Shit. And uh, we see this guy, Walter. And people think he's a piece of shit. He's just this total loser guy. And one day he takes a poop. And uh, the poop is talking to him. So he brings it into his uh, job. I love this, like, classic old-school cartooning Spiegelman's doing. Like, this looks like it would be a great old newspaper strip. Well, in an alternate dimension. And he shows the poop to his boss. And just like that talking frog in the Warner Brothers cartoons, of course, the poop says nothing. So the boss kicks him out and says, you fucking nut. You're fired. So the poop says, don't worry about it. I'm synced into the organic cycle of the universe. With my excremental vision, we can make a killing in the stock market. So Walter becomes a millionaire. And one day this hot lady reporter comes in. And uh, he's kind of pretending that, oh yeah, it's just a turn in the box. He doesn't give him credit. And the, the poop is uh, he's humiliated. I guess his name is Matthew, the poop has a name. And uh, he decides to sabotage Walter. He's, he wants revenge. So he gives them all bad advice. Pretty soon, Walter's on the street. Uh, he's lost all his money. And the epilogue, <laughs> that sexy reporter ends up dating the poop, uh, Matthew. And Walter ends up a, a bathroom attendant at Grand Central Station. And every now and then, he's... He's seen yelling into the toilet like, hey, can any of you guys hear me? Hello? He wants to find another talking shit, I guess. I love this. Fun facts. It's kind of like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Turd in the shape of a Madonna found in the home of Justin Green. When someone incurred the wrath of songster Judy Garland, they'd often get a hot, juicy BM in the mail. I don't think these are true, but they're very funny. Here we have a one-pager from Bill Griffith, Hopalong Cassidy's Wild Desire. And it just shows Hopalong Cassidy in his twilight years, and he's kind of a fat slob and kind of obnoxious, hitting on this woman half his age, and just being a pain in the ass, basically. Another Shankman thing. Y'all come. Many pearls, y'all come. And, uh, I take it that Shankman is obviously seems to be a, a gearhead. A lot of these comics are talking about hot rods and uh, all kinds of vehicles. He's uh, obviously to that scene. 
once again, just little vignettes of people doing whatever, what they did in the early 70s. Here's Randy and Sharice in The Second Dimension by Bill Griffith. And uh, these characters, uh, he's had other stories with them. They actually are two-dimensional, like literally, like they're cardboard cutout type people. And uh, they're, they're, as you can imagine, they're very two-dimensional. They're very shallow. He's kind of uh, satirizing people in the early 70s, the kind of people who like are just into how they look. And, you know, what crappy TV shows are on TV and fashion and being consumers, you know. At the end, the author actually says, uh, well, the Randy and Sharice are saying bye for now. Well, forever. I'm tired of writing about these two. So basically he's retiring these two characters for good. Bill Griffith's done with them. Oh, this is amazing. This is the Centerfold Manifesto. This was actually a poster. I wish I could have, <laughs> I, I doubt they still sell it, but it's totally a poster. I mean, it's meant to be a poster. And this is the three main, uh, you know, uh, short order guys collaborating. But it does say down here, cameo appearances by Art Crumb, Justin Green, Willie Murphy, J Jay Kinney, and some guy named Stuart. And even the, Comics joint site didn't know who Stuart was. So up top, we see this kind of almost like an artist cartoonist manifesto. The artist's responsibility to the reader, the reader's responsibility to an artist. Mental instability is a tool and must be kept well sharpened. Comics must be personal. I like this how it says, we must study the work of the masters, of which we have none. Because they're kind of like sui generis. They're starting this whole thing. These comics for adults, basically. This has never existed. Death to the old order. And uh, that's really nice, dense cartoony here. It's kind of seamless. I can't even pick apart who draws what. So then let me uh, put this uh, so you can see the bottom here. So we see the old order and we see this guy with a gun to this little kid's head, basically forcing him to read whatever kids comics were back then, you know, superheroes. They have a nod to some modern stuff. They have Onan the Barbarian. So that's the old order, but now we see the new order. And this is almost like predicting the future where there'd be comic book stores that just sold all kinds of comics for adults. And it's really fun. They just have all these crazy titles they made up. Pajamas on Backwards, number four. Pseudo Lizard reprints. Obviously a nod to Von Baudet there. Bad Vibe. Incest Joy. Nasal Tales of Nasal Congestion. Tits and Guns. <laughs> I think I might have found the Art Crumb cameo. I don't know if that's one of the artists parodying Art Crumb. It says Old Shoes Comics or Old Shoe Comics. So I can't really, f I couldn't find any of these uh, guest artists in here. So that, uh, Justin Green, I don't know. But I love this, uh, just, God, this is like so dense with uh, information and nice cartooning. Good stuff, okay. Now we have another Shankman piece featuring the Hood Brothers. These are like the total gearhead brothers. They're always fixing cars, racing cars, thinking about cars. And uh, once again, just every panel is just them saying some random thing. Not much of a plot. But man, I like Shankman's artwork. It's dingy. It's dirty. And, uh, yeah, not much happens in a Joe Shakespeare comic. Man, I miss the 70s. 70s were kind of like this. Even as a kid, I could see. Yeah, things are a little dirtier now. <laughs> but they were funner. 
Here we have another Spiegelman piece, Alienation Blues. And this totally represents this thing where this is obviously, you know, whatever. And, you know, an artistic comic. I don't quite get it. But obviously it's not like he's pandering to any audience. He's just following his own muse. He starts with these random quotes. It's uh, interesting. I noticed that in these 70s comics, Spiegelman loves to do this. Pepper his comics with famous quotes of uh, from famous people. He even quotes Count Dracula. Just really nice cartooning. Zippy the Zany Zealot by Bill Griffith here. And uh, Zippy is visiting a monastery. It's a little tour group. And the monks mistake him for one of them because he's wearing his, you know, muumuu. Kind of looks like their robes. And while he's uh, working in the gardens, this one monk is whispers to him. He says, like, you know, we're going to break out of here at 4 o'clock past the word. <laughs> so they're planning like a jailbreak. I guess some of these monks feel like they're prisoners here. And Zippy totally gets into it. All of a sudden, he starts speaking in this, like, 30s, you know, jail movie dialect. Lay off, will you, screw? I ain't crying no tears for no punk orphans. So these two guys are like, okay, you're in. And uh, Zippy's still doing this shtick. And he just jumps over the wall. He's just like, guys, it's easy. Let's just jump over the wall if you want to leave. And so they follow him. Zippy runs off ahead of them. But these guys are thrilled that they're going to get to see the city again. The wonders of the city. So I guess these guys have been in the monastery for God knows how long. Living like, you know. In a primitive state. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I need some water. Here's another Joe Shankman night train. Once again, a little travelogue. Just showing random stuff. Richmond, Raleigh, North Carolina. So odd. This is one of a... Uh, Art Spiegelman's like kind of fun experimental comics, Zipper Tunes and Moray Melodies. Moray is a wavy, rippled pattern. And it features a skinless Perkins. So he says, a somersault for your amusement. And he does the somersault. And as he's in the middle of it, his Moray uh, pattern, his Zipper Tone that shades him, comes off of him. And is like on the wall. After he walks away, his shading pattern continues the somersault and walks off all on his own. And then he says, da, da, dots all, folks. Oh, that's rich. It's pretty clever. Uh, Bill Griffith, uh, Mr. Toad, Mr. The Toad, excuse me, uh, comic, where Mr. Toad is just getting stymied by Zippy and random strangers. He can't win. He's trying to pull this practical joke and everyone's wise to him. We have some real advertisements for all the artists' wares. Oh, and here's the, here's the piece de resistance. This is A Prisoner on the Hell Planet by Art Spiegelman. This has been reprinted many times as kind of an exemplar of how good comics can be. Especially back then. I mean... People weren't doing shit like this until, you know, a little later on. This was pretty rare. Just a full-on expressionistic autobiographical story. And with amazing craft. So just, just look at this logo. I mean, Spiegelman's going to town on this one. So basically, Art Spiegelman's telling this true, true story of uh, how in 1968, his mother killed herself. She left no note. Her father, his father discovered her. Art at the time was just getting, getting out of a mental institution for a nervous breakdown. So he wasn't in the best place in the first place. And uh, he finds out his mom killed him herself. So he's obviously devastated. Luckily a cousin's there to like, you know, take him... Take him around and help him out a little. 
Look at how the drawing here, as Art starts to cry. And Art's almost having like flashbacks to his breakdown. Like the doctor is turning into this weird expressionistic uh, creature laughing at him. Even his cousin is. It's really, a lot of the art in here is like very, I think purposefully, it's reminiscent of like those Lynn Ward um, woodcut novels from the 30s, 20s and 30s. Those like picture novels, which um, it takes a lot of craft. I mean, God, how many little lines are in these pictures? So art needs help, but his dad is even worse. His dad is like just, he's he's wrecked. So Art finds himself in the position of he's got to help his dad. He's supposed to comfort his dad when he needs comforting. So it's just all around not a good, not very good. At the funeral, the father just wigs out, climbs in the coffin, screaming his wife's name, crying. It's, uh, it's a bad scene. Art just leaves the funeral. It's too much. And look at the way he draws him here. This expressionistic style. And then look at this as he's really losing it. It's just like, everything's all nutty. But basically, it's just turning abstract. So it seems like a, a lot of his relatives and friends of the family seem to blame him. It could be just his paranoia, but he thinks whatever they talk to him, they're thinking, you know, it's your fault. Because, you know, he was a hippie kid. His mom was always worried about him. And, uh, oh man, this is harsh. So he has a memory. He remembers the last time he saw his mom. And she comes into the, his bedroom late at night. And she says, she says, Artie, you still love me, don't you? And he turns away, resentful of the way she tightened the umbilical cord. So she walked out and closed the door. So, I mean, that's so harsh. Imagine your, your mom kills herself and you gotta remember, you know, like pushing her away. So then we end with a little soliloquy from uh, Art Spiegelman. Congratulations, you've committed the perfect crime. You put me here, shorted all my circuits, cut my nerve endings and crossed my wires. You murdered me, mommy. And you left me here to take the rap. And then some of the other screws are going, pipe down, Max. So I was trying to sleep. Oh, man, that's harsh. That's, uh... But you see what I'm saying about this difference between this and normal undergrounds? You know, like uh, Gilbert Shelton wasn't writing shit like this and Corbin. Spiegelman realized you could do something more with comics. Him and Justin Green and a few other guys. Here we have another little uh, snapshot of some decadent honky tonk bar by Joe Shankman. Cowboys and Indians have it out at Big Dud and Booze Dead End. <laughs> it's just all these degenerates. On the back cover, we have Bill Cr Griffith doing a Cloud Funston strip. This one's kind of funny. He, uh, it's almost reminiscent of the poop story and the Warner, Warner Brothers talking frog thing. So he comes into this diner, Claude does, with his frog at his shoulder. And he's like, you better get him out of here. And he says, no, you don't understand. He could do the most amazing thing. Um, he could do a handstand. And if he can't do it, I'll pay triple the price for my breakfast today. So he takes the bet. <laughs> and <laughs> the frog does a little handstand. And the cook says, jumping puff balls, he's done it. <laughs> and for gosh sakes, look at that. He's giving us the black power salute into the bargain. Oh, that makes me laugh. It's so silly. I don't know why it's, I find that hilarious. Okay, short order comics number two. This is kind of oversized. It's like midway between a magazine size and a comic book, which is nice because the art is so dense and detailed in uh, these comics. That I wish it was even bigger. So in Short Order Comics number two, they open it up to other artists. There's a bunch of other artists in here. So it's more of a proper anthology. And uh, we have a nice cover of uh, by Bill Griffith. 
Inside front cover is this another little experimental weird Art Spiegelman strip. Don't get around much anymore. And we just see this old shut-in who uh, doesn't, as mu doesn't have much, but he's very content not having to leave his apartment. He's got an old stereo. He's got a pile of old Life magazines for entertainment. The TV has no sound. He's got an empty refrigerator, but he's got some crackers, and he's got all the water he can drink from the sink. And that's all he needs. Uh, first story here is The Schlock People by Bill Griffith. Bill Griffith was so good at this stuff. You know, like his Griffith Observatory, observatory strips? Just, uh, you know, chronicling the foibles and ridiculousness of modern trends and how stupid people are. And... Uh, we see this kind of like uh, dress factory, uh, clothing factory. And we see these old guys who are just like, I don't understand these kids today, what they're wearing. And the old uh, tailor is just like, yeah, it's shoddy material. Who would want to wear this shit? But it's selling like hotcakes. Who are we to complain? So I guess they're making all this crappy new stuff that's selling like amazing and we see this hipster fashionista guy. And he's, these fashions are ludicrous. But I think I saw shit like this in the early 70s. You would see stuff this embarrassingly goofy. Just these huge, stupid platforms which are hard to walk on. Insane flared pants, bell bottoms, and just really shoddy material. You can't even wear it that, you know, more than six times without it tearing. <clears throat> but these people don't care. They probably are only planning on wearing it a few times and then moving on to some other fashion. Just ridiculous. At the end of the comic, he's actually wearing this thing that's made of lead and carbon. It's basically a big metal suit of armor, but bulbous and tapered and ridiculous looking. And of course, it becomes the big fashion, but people find that it's really hard to walk around. So people are falling and knocking into each other just in the name of fashion. And at the end, we see Bill Griffith, his persona. He's a thrift store shopper, and he's so annoyed because all of this stuff obviously filters down to the thrift stores pretty quickly because it's shit. People probably buy this stuff and realize, oh, this is dumb. So his whole Salvation Army is full of this crap. And he just wants a pair of trousers, continental trousers, and some hush puppies. <laughs> and all he can find is this crazy shit. Oh, this is amazing. I wish I had more comics by this guy. George Kuchar, A Reason to Live. George Kuchar uh, is in a handful of undergrounds, didn't do many. He's great. His stories are just nuts. He, um, I guess, is a famous, or was a famous filmmaker. Uh, making short films. He's considered very highly in the cinematic world. He was very famous, like up there with like Kenneth Anger and stuff like that. Him and his brother. But his comics are great. I guess he was just uh, neighbors to Art Spiegelman and a few other underground cartoonists, and they'd, they were like, hey man, you should draw some comics. This one is, uh, starts off with this woman, and uh, her, her boyfriend just left her, or husband. She's bereft. Then she sees this headline about a tornado killing eight people. And she gets this like fire in her belly. She's like, I must prepare against these monsters. And she goes through this regimen and she uh, works out and she molds her body and senses to perfection for the task that lies ahead. So she becomes a tornado spotter, like at the Weather Bureau office. I love this panel here with this crazy lettering showing the sirens going off for the storm season. So uh, one day she's, you know, waiting for tornadoes. So she's taking a little swim in the sw local swimming hole. And she sees that the clouds are getting a little uh, interesting, let's say. And then this other guy comes out of the water hole. And he's very smitten with her. And he just totally hits on her. He's very forward. And he says, let's go back to my trailer. So while he's taking her back to his tra her, his trailer, 
the a tornado is starting. But she's oblivious because she's so enraptured with this guy. And the tornado comes. This is just such good cartooning. Like the, I, It kills me that this guy was lost to film. Fuck film. You should have done more comics. Comics are better. And uh, it totally destroys the local town, this tornado. And people are saying, why, were, why weren't we warned? <laughs> Who was supposed to watch the skies? The answer lies on rumpled sheets. So she missed the whole thing because she was fucking. So when she goes outside, she sees the whole town devastated. <laughs> and then a 200 pound hailstone drops on her head, squashing her to death. And that's the end. Oh, I love his crazy little stories. Tank Town Follies, USA. An another one of Joe Shankman's just uh, descent into decadence. This town is just like, it's like the city from Hobo with a shotgun. It's just this totally corrupt, disgusting little town where pretty much everyone is just trying to get drunk at all times. Almost every citizen is constantly drunk, constantly just doing so shitty stuff. I love the drawing in here. I look at it. How much is packed in it here? This is like the equivalent of two pages of comics. You know, with the amount of panels, the amount of detail and captions. And just more scenes of Tank Town. Everyone just doing their best to get a little action, have a little fun. This is nice. Uh, Jay Kinney contributes a comic. It's called Dry Ice. We see 1967. Uh, this couple and their friends are just bored in a parking lot, hanging out like teenagers used to do. Well, I they probably still do it. They're listening to some goofy pop song on the radio. Then we see 1974. This couple, they're kind of like a hippie couple, living off welfare. Still, their life's pretty crappy. Buying a, buying shit with food stamps and just watching crappy TV in squalor. 1984, it looks like they're uh, doing better. So this is 10 years in the future, according to, the, you know, from this time. So look at this, though. They're, they're watching on a giant screen TV. They're watching porn in their own home with, like, speak great speakers for sound. So we kind of predicted that. That you'll be able to, because this is years before, uh, you know, VCRs and the idea that you could rent stuff for your own home. And they're, look at their crazy fa hair fashions. He's trying to predict what uh, fashions might be like in 10 years. Looks like they're doing pretty well for themselves. They're like their upper middle class. They uh, go into their daughter's room and... It's kind of weird. I think she's listening to these headphones, listening to the local DJ, and he's trying to make it uh, kind of um, slang. Like, what'll slang be like in 10 years? Inject the lek in just a sec here on Keenal, the Keen No, Keenal, your high five hit cycle run through, lek style supreme. But first, snip outs, look tight and hold your beam. <laughs> like, it's just this beatnik crazy patois. But, you know, he predicted maybe uh, in the future. Slang, slang changes, you know. The little girl's playing with a sex mutilation model. Cut like flesh. And then we jump way ahead to 2020. And uh, we see on the little hologram uh, televideo thing that their daughter's all grown up. And she says, Ma, Pa, my fertilization papers just came through. And the mother, they're in like zero gravity. I guess that's common in the future. And uh, they're watching this, this crazy like entertainment that's like holograms of geometric shapes being all psychedelic and stuff. And they're in a retirement community. I like that. I don't know why. It's not. It's not really a story. It's just this little snapshots of this couple growing older here we have race riot by joe shankman this is ridiculous this is a, a tale of how all the 
the, the human race got their different colors, you know, and ethnicities. So we see God, and in Joe Shankman's mind, God is just another scumbag, likes to work on his car, put his car in races, and uh, always constantly drinking beer. But he's uh, always working on something. So, you know, one day he's just like, hey, I'm going to create all of these people, human beings. So he does. He wakes up early, makes all these people. But he says, oh, I didn't give everyone their colors, though. So you're not quite finished. So so tomorrow, Sunday, be here at 730 because I got a race at, at 10 o'clock down at the Salt Flats. So Sunday morning, everyone shows, well, most everyone shows up. And God makes a bunch of them Asian. God makes a bunch of them Native Americans or First Nations of any country, I imagine. And then he realizes that uh, a bunch of other people are missing. Oh, I'm sorry. Everyone else he makes white who's there. But then he realizes people are missing. So he tells his assistant, he says, some angel. He's like, well, well, get those guys out, get their asses over here. They got to get their color. So he finds these, a bunch of people who are just like drinking and hanging out. And they, they're like, oh, we forgot. Today's that day. We want a color. So they all head down there. And some of them, you can hear them in tiny little word balloons like, hey, I hope you're not, you haven't run out of gold yet. One of them's all like, ooh, I want to be maroon. And uh, they're all so excited. They're kind of rushing God's stage and pushing forward. And they're like toppling God's throne. And God's like, hey, careful there. Get back, get back. And in the confusion, the crowd, so b busy fussing and carrying on, thought the Lord said, get black. And they all turned black. <laughs> Sorry, that's so dumb. I don't even know if I should have recited it to you, but... I really like it, just, it's nuts. Here's Pillow Talk by Bill Griffith. And uh, this is uh, inside a mental institution. We see four beds. Sharice Fisk, I assume she was a sex symbol back in the heyday, uh, her heyday. Alfred Jerry, the playwright. Bobby Fisher, the chess master. And Zippy, the pinhead. And they're all talking in their sleep. And of course, it's just all kind of crazy non sequiturs and weird shit. And uh, then they start to wake up and they start having a pillow fight. And the nurse comes in. And so like, get back to sleep, you guys. Quit your jabbering. So they throw a pillow in her head. <laughs> and Bobby Fisher kind of uh, sets up a chess game with one of the attendants, I think he is. Or maybe a fellow patient. I don't know. But just very, just odd. Um, all it is is a bunch of people just saying kind of weird stuff. Oh, this is uh, nice. They got Michael McMillan, a uh, great underground cartoonist, um, to contribute. Captain Flashlight meets the Short Order Ghoul. I loved Michael McMillan. had such a style, such a style of its time. This is so early 70s. There were so many like graphic design in the early 70s that had this kind of retro bulbous feel to it and uh it's very of its time but i i like it a lot it just shows how like quirky he was you know before the story starts he just has nocturnal emissions captain flashlight shows you the five danger signals <laughs> and we see all these various things emitting gases or liquids it's very odd so basically in this town there's this uh racket there's a gang of ghouls, they're uh, grave robbers, and they're led by this master criminal, the dog, who looks like a dog. And they take the the human flesh that they bury, uh, dig up, and they sell it to local restaurants. It's this whole racket. So one day, Captain Flashlight's at a diner, and uh, there's a thing in a soup. It's a identification plate for a vault. And he says, what's the meaning of this? And he attacks the chef. And the chef tries to shoot him, but he's bulletproof. And because uh, I guess they're all in on it together, the the diners and the, the gang. 
So he zaps him with his flashlight, his proton ray, and he goes to the cemetery where that vault is, and he sees the operation, and he chases after the guys. And they fall, they're running away so in such a panic that they fall into the deep vault to their deaths. Except for the dog. The dog stops in time. And uh, apparently there's like some zombies down there. Some of this meat ain't so dead. <laughs> and I think they're cooking up the guys who just jumped. I mean, it doesn't really matter. This guy doesn't care about plot. He's just, it's all gags and craziness and surreal stuff. <laughs> it's weird at the end. Captain uh, Flashlight goes back to that diner again and again. He's like, for some reason, I just can't stop eating this stuff. <laughs> He's got a taste for human flesh, I guess. Oh, I definitely need more of this guy in my collection. I don't have much Michael McMillan. This is fun. This is uh, Willie Murphy, the great underground cartoonist, doing uh, parodies of all the comic strips of the day. And, But it's definitely off. It's so odd. Like, this is supposed to be like a Milt Caniff type adventure strip, you know, with all the shading and the duotone. <laughs> but it's nuts. It's so off and just askew. It's just very weird. And of course, none of none of them are funny. I think he's making fun of the strips, how the strips are so lame. Even then they were lame, you know? And the early 70s comic strips were pretty shitty. Just as shitty as they are now, probably. Got Andy Cap knockoff. And uh, here's Snuffy Smith. This one is just crazy. It's weird. It kind of reminds me of like, I don't know why, but like Martini Baton Art when Peter Bagg was drawing in that style. We got Hagar. Friendly Vikings and Monies. Kind of fun. Another Joe Shankman comic about the Hood Brothers. And apparently the Hood Brothers bought a used car lot. And this is basically them. It's like an advertisement. I'm talking about all the cars they're selling. And it's kind of weird. It's like not even really jokes. I don't know. Maybe if I was a real gearhead, I'd get it. I'd get some of the humor there, there, if there is any to be had. But I just, I love it. Just the, I don't know. It's just like this, like I said earlier, it's like the snapshot into this other greasy 70s world. I don't know. Oh, we get another George Kuchar strip. Herzog Holiday. The day begins, and we can already tell this is going to be a pleasant story. Look at these giant, scary rats that are just scavenging through the garbage, eating birds out of trees. A noise awakens Mrs. Herzog, and she looks out the window, and there's this horrible car crash. God, I love this art so much. Something's different about it. Something that seems like it's off, but it seems so right on. So she pukes out of her window right into a pedestrian up below. Then she takes her dog for a walk, and her dog's like this fucking feral savage who's just dragging her. So by the time he makes it to the park, she's just like knocked out. It looks like she's been brutalized. The dog pees on her leg. This poor woman is just like she's the, the butt of a cosmic joke or something. The world's against her. So she goes shopping... And uh, these two guys attack her, these two muggers, and leave her for dead. Nobody even helps her. They're just like, lousy drunk, wake her up. So then later that night, uh, she gets a letter from her son, a bright spot in her day. And as she's about to get in her house, some pervert exposes himself to her. And when she goes into her apartment, her dog is torn apart. The whole place has wrecked it. And then the letter from her son just says, Dear Ma, please loan me $200. Love, Alex. So Mrs. Herzog ends her day as she jumps out of the window screaming maniacally to end it all. Oh, George Kuchar, maybe my new favorite cartoonist. I don't know. I got to find more of his stuff. Here's a nice little one-pager by Bill Griffith, Personality Cult. And this is just a... Uh, Showing like some 30s, 40s Hollywood party and Walter Winchell's there. He was like the gossip, big gossip of the day. He he could make or break a career. 
he would like his column was read by everyone and if he heard a rumor that like some hollywood star was having an affair or was gay he'd like uh write about it then you'd be your career was over so he's at this party just commenting on all the people and all their little scandals and everyone's just all like ah oh, shit walter's here Liberace is seen hanging out with Jimmy Durante. What's what's up with that? Finally, the butler says, you got to go. Get out of here. You're very dis distasteful, sir. And when he leaves, for some reason, this little uh, this uh, dummy gets in his car. I don't know if it's supposed to be uh, Bergen. What, what was his name? Charlie Charlie McCarthy or whatever. He was a famous ventriloquist dummy at the time. And he's just so angry. Walter Winchell, he takes out a gun and he, he blows off the dummy's head. And he says, I know who you are. You're a press agent for Adolf Hitler. And it says paranoid at the bottom. So I don't know if Walter Winchell was like that, but uh, I, I'd love I would love this, like, many more episodes of this comic. Just Walter Winchell showing up and exposing these Hollywood scandals. Another kooky Joe Shankman piece. Nothing to say, but it's okay. Good morning, good morning. And uh, this is just totally random scenes. Various city scenes. Lots of sordidness. Lots of great cartooning. I like this guy. He's high and drunk at the same time. And his face is just like this weird abstract. Martini glasses for eyes. Kind of cool. Funky junkies. Junkie twist. Super stupor. Early morning. Dog walkers. Street walkers. Stray cats and queers. The rest of the city sleeps it off. Oh, this is nice. They got Rory Hayes to contribute a story. Granny Crackbaggy, the short order cook. And it's, you know, like most Rory Hayes comics, it's very childlike. Not much to this. But uh, Granny is, you know, happy, happily running this restaurant. Good food, low prices. But this bear comes in one day and doesn't like the service. He jumps up in anger and he just destroys the restaurant. The next day, they're talking about it in the newspapers and granny is just crying she lost she's like i'm really on the short end of the stick because her restaurant is gone very strange very strange here we have a couple of short strips uh diane newman uh her famous dd glitz character this is an early one yeah, it's just a little you know little vignette of dd glitz's life suburban kind of shallow middle-class American lady. And we have The Toadettes by Bill Griffith. This one's really well-drawn. And the Toadettes uh, come across this uh, cult in the middle of the woods. Abilitology. Oh, here's another Art Spiegelman masterpiece. You've probably seen this before. This has been reprinted many times as well. Ace Hole, Midget Detective. This is a just a tour de force of cartooning, and it's it's about cartooning, also about art in general. And uh, it's written in this hard-boiled style by this midget detective, Ace Hole. Once again, we have a quote, uh, which uh, Art Spiegelman loves to do back then. And uh, this character, Ace Hole, it's like his narrate, his thought balloons, his thoughts are the the hard-boiled narration. This kind of kooky guy just walks around thinking his own narration all the time. So uh, he gets a job from Lawrence Potato Head, the art dealer. He, has to, he wants him to dig up a, a guy named Flugelman, a bird who passed him some bum Picassos. I didn't want the job, but down these mean streets of Midget must go. So he's thinking all this as if he was the writer of a book about himself. A good-looking frail cruised past me, called it a hunch, but I decided to tailor. I love this lady. She's drawn like a Picasso drawing really well, too. 
And she rounds a corner and all of a sudden he hears a gunshot and a scream. And when he runs around the corner, he finds this guy. And it's Flugelman. Uh, turns out Flugelman used to be an underground cartoonist, but then anti-pornography laws uh, forced him to go into another business, which was art forgery. He finds a letter on his person. It says, and there's a little arrow that says plot device. And it's a letter that says, Dear Flugy, watch out. Lauren suspects. Love, Greta. So he breaks into Flugelman's office and he gets conked on the head. And the last thing he sees is Lawrence Potato Head and that Picasso girl. I love this little thing. This is uh, showing like how playful he's being with this uh, comic. I dived down an inky pit and splashed into slumberland. And he's drawn just like little Nemo after he falls out of his bed. And also, he actually just reprinted these panels from Little Nemo, showing these like explosions, almost mirroring like what it feels like getting hit on the head, you know, like you probably see a bright light. It's almost like it's an explosion. And I'm pretty sure in this sequence he's dreaming because it gets really odd. We see this Picasso running around saying all these weird, uh, you know, well, not weird, but quotes about art and stuff. On the TV, the cats and Chandler kids are getting spanked by the captain. Lisa was like riding this cat, telling the audience, I was an ugly kid. In fact, I was so ugly, my parents would call a proctologist whenever I caught a head cold. Some corny old Borscht Belt joke. So it's just, yeah, he's obviously dreaming. I, I assume so. We see him on the cat now, all drawn abstract and weird. This is very Harvey Kurtzman here. Flugelman's on the TV and he starts crying. And he's crying so much that the room fills up with water and pretty soon it's like an ocean. And then in the middle, we see the ghost of Picasso, really well drawn. You have to have an idea of what you are going to do, but it should be a vague idea. And I think that's, he put that there because Art Spiegelman's doing that. Like, this is just pure da-da storytelling. Like, it's just jumping around in a dreamlike state. So he's in the ocean. And he wakes up. And uh, so he wakes up, you know, after he got conked out. And it turns out this is Greta. The Picasso woman is Greta, Lawrence Potato Head's wife. And he basically tries to pay, buy, buy, uh, pay him off. Gives him this money. And I love this. So Art Spiegelman draws all these holes in the panel as if like um, three-dimensional holes because Ace Hole's thinking, I sense that his story had more holes than my socks and smelled just as bad. So he does all these things uh, where the art reflects what he's saying. And uh, he says, I finally figured the setup. These two vultures were trying to frame me. And he's framed in the dollar bill thing here. Hold it, you birds can't play me for a pigeon. And then in his brain, narration, I snarled as my talons reached for my Roscoe. So this guy's kind of crazy. He just thinks he's in a book, I guess. He finds that letter that he found on Flugelman. Plot device, remember, it says. And, you know, it's his ace in the hole. And so they show this ace card. They conk him on the head with a blackjack. They knock him out again. So he's having another dream sequence where he's underwater. He sees a Picasso fish, a Flugelman fish. And he wakes up in the lap of Greta. And she's like caressing his forehead. And she's like, my husband went out for tobacco. We must hurry. He'll kill you, but I don't want you dead. And she kisses him. And uh, she's uh, 
some kind of dame because he's just like, oh my God. That was the best kiss ever. She had more sides than a revolving door. I don't know much about art, but this babe was Jake with me. So Lawrence and Flugerman were partners. She's filling us in. Uh, all went well until she fell for Flugy. Started having an affair. Lawrence found out and killed him. And he figured you'd be a, you'd be a good fall guy. So that's why he hired Ace Hole. So uh, Lawrence comes home, pulls his Roscoe. And uh, he realizes that uh, Greta double-crossed him or cheated him. And I love this. His potato face gets all scrambled. His face was scrambled with rage. He was as yellow as old newsprint. And all of a sudden, his suit is uh, his newsprint. So she says, shoot a shoot. And he squeezes the trigger. And for some reason, we see this like forest setting. And then we see the Comics Code Authority passage that talks about scenes of excessive violence shall be prohibited. In every instance, good shall triumph over evil and the criminal punished for his misdeeds. And then they just show Guernica by Picasso, which I guess is all about violence. So instead of seeing the violence of him shooting the guy, this is like a censored thing by the Commas Code. And uh, when the smoke cleared, there wasn't enough left of Potato Head to make a decent knish. <laughs> it's a good line. And all of a sudden, Greta is all like bereft. And she's like, oh, my sweet patootie. I like to see uh, Spiegelman has a little note. Send a potato to Spiegelman, and it's the real address of Apex Novelties. So I wonder how many people sent him potatoes. I would, I wouldn't mind a free potato. I should try this. I should publish a comic and just ask for potatoes. She says, "My sweet patootie, he was a heel, but he was my husband, and he was a well-heeled heel." And she starts laughing. She's kind of losing it. She got hysterical. But then he realizes a piece of the puzzle snaps into place. And of course, we see this puzzle motif. Uh, Greta pegged them all for dummies. She played everyone off each other. You know, she's a typical femme fatale. Like in all those film noir books, the woman is always poison. She's always a snake. And he realizes that, you know, she didn't care for him at all. And she just, she leaves, runs out the door. She looked back with a laugh and dared me to follow. And here's where it starts getting weird. We realize how delusional Ace is. I raced down to the corral and mounted my stallion. But really what's happening is he jumps on this cute little dog that's out in the city streets. But in his head, He's on this amazing stallion riding along the hard packed trail in the desert. And then we have, uh, this is weird. He samples a little Chester Gould panel he found that almost mirrors what's going on. These people in a theater seeing something on the screen. But I tell you that midget is Jerome, my Jerome, the same little guy that double crossed me and left me. I, it's just weird. They just put that in there. Just cut out a Dick Tracy panel. Man, Art Spiegelman draws dogs really cute, I gotta say. That's the cutest fucking dog ever. And so he's trying to ride this dog. And the the owner, who looks like uh, the Cats and Jammer kid's mom or aunt or whatever she is, she yanks him off and just throws him into the wall. And it's like, did he hurt, hoit my little doll, darling? Dear nasty shrimper. So he wakes up a little while later. And all of a sudden, in his head, he's narrating a completely different story. It's like he's totally forgotten about that whole plot that he's involved in. And he's telling a new story in his head, even though he's just walking home. 
But in his head, they're like, they flashed some brass knucks at me and tried to make me spill what I knew. Over my dead body, I barked. <laughs> so we realized that this is this poor little lonely guy. That whole thing was just all in his head. And it always will be. He That's his life. He just probably bought a trench coat and thinks he's a detective. And this is great that Art Spiegelman adds this old, he adds this old ad from probably a, a pulp, an old pulp. Be a detective. You know, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope. You can be a detective. Also be an artist. Draw for money. So this sad, lonely guy probably did that, but really thinks he's a detective. Oh, man, that story's so good. Here we have another Joe Shank Shankman scene of decadence. Western still life. And somewhere, it looks like it's the Southwest or something. Just all these random skivos and, and gnarly people. Bail bond, liquor store. He just makes a... Joe Shankman's version of America, it's all on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> it's like there's no right side of the tracks in Joe Shankman's world. Here we have a comic, Real Dream by Art Spiegelman. Um, if you saw the video we put up about a month ago uh, of ARG, Alan Moore's um, self-published anthology comic, uh, Artists Against Rampant Government Homophobia. It was a benefit comic for uh, uh, to fight these laws that were going to hurt gay people and uh this was reprinted in there but in black and white i forgot how beautiful the colors are in this like just that logo alone that's some really nice design some great stuff and uh it's uh, you know i talked about it that time it's just it's a real dream art spiegelman had where him and his girlfriend go to a gay shoe store i don't know what that entails a gay shoe store but it gets raided by police and to get out of being arrested, Art Spiegelman has a copy of Playboy magazine and the cops are like, let him through, Louis. The kid's hetero. He's all right. Really nice trip. So that's it. Short order comics number one and two. I would say two of the best underground comics of uh, the underground comic era. Probably, uh, well, definitely up there in the top 20. Some really good stuff in here. And uh, even the stuff that isn't so good, it's kind of interesting and experimental and, you know, I admire it, let's say. But it's all high quality, amazing stuff. So I hope you can find these. You probably won't find them that cheap. These are probably, I paid more for these than most comics I pay for, which means I paid like $10 or something or 12. That to me is a lot to pay for a comic. But I hope you enjoyed it. I loved looking at these again. This was kind of revelatory. I kind of forgot how great these were. And um, and hopefully I'll also see you here next time at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.